down to Bathurst and on to Oran Park. The qualifying and race pace through season 95 has been set by those aboard a board. Only Larry Perkins, Peter Brock and Mark Scaife have offered any competitive resistance to the FORDs of Shell Series champ John Bauer and runner-up Glenn Seaton. In the interest of preserving parity between Henry and the General, officials have clipped the wings on the Fords to slow their aero flow and make Holden part of the show. By sheer weight of numbers, Commodore is the popular pick at Mount Panorama this weekend. The King is still one short of that magic ten. Sandown pole sitter Craig Lowndes cannot be overlooked, nor can Mark Scaife, Larry Perkins, or even the Coke boys, if they don't wrinkle their toys. Dick Johnson has written several chapters of Ford folklore here at the mountain, and today he is ready to answer the challenge. So too is Seaton, last year's fastest qualifier. Can he possibly oust Johnson and Brock and make it two from two? Well, we're about to find out as the Seven Network welcomes you to Bathurst, New South Wales and the traditional pole day shuffle that is the Tui's Top Ten. Hello and welcome to Bathurst on Tui's Top Ten Day, a beautiful day. We've had some very fast racing already at Bathurst this week, very competitive and a warm welcome to Gary Wilkinson. There's a lot to like about the top ten this year, Gary, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. Evenly divided. You've got five and five, Holdens and Fords. You've got, uh, in the top ten, drivers that have won the race 20 times between them, less than a second between the top eight qualifiers, and you've got this young blood, Craig Lowndes, Stephen Johnson, coming in here to challenge the top guys. You couldn't ask for a better scenario. Well, it may be a changing of the guard, but some of the biggest names in the sport are on the grid for the top ten today. Larry Perkins, winner 93, teaming up with Russell Engel, but Perkins driving the car in the top ten. Glenn Seaton, of course, shooting for pole again. And Dick Johnson, the old stager, waving the flag for Queensland. Peter Brock, winner nine times, shooting for number ten. Mark Scape, twice winner uh, before, and a very fast man behind the wheel. Craig Lowndes, as I mentioned, a man to watch for the future. Wayne Gardner, well, the Coke boys have had some bad luck, but hoping they can put it together today. Charlie O'Brien, well, Stephen Johnson is driving this car in the top ten. Another terrific young talent. Alan Jones, well, what more can we say? A former world motor racing champion and Tony Longhurst, another former winner. Gary, let's join uh, Mike Raymond, who's down on the track walking his way through the top ten. Thank you, Bruce McAvaney. What a lineup we have for the two is top ten today here at Mount Panorama. Tony Longhurst, Ford, you must be happy. Tenth. Tenth. At least I'm not going to slip back any further where I am. I can only go forward. I hope you do too. Good luck to you, Tony. The Peter Jackson team have two in the lineup today. Glenn Seaton, who's a little up towards the front. And the man who starts at the 35 car, great reputation, Alan Jones. Morning, Michael. You look well. Thank you very much. A quick time. Yeah, well, I'm very happy with the car. We've slowly got it better and better as the weekend's progressed. And uh, we've got a new fresh engine in now, so I'm looking forward to it. Have a good ride, Alan. Thank you. Any number of Fords. We have, in fact, five Fords and we have five Commodores making up the top ten. The youngest driver in the field, it's Junior Johnson. How are the nerves? A little like that this morning? Yeah, they're there, I can tell you. What did Mum say? She's got a husband and she's got a son now in the top ten. She's uh, she's quite nervous herself, I think. She's going to lock herself in the toilet so before the top ten runoff. I won't touch that with a barge pole. <laughs> Have a good run. <laughs> Stephen you. Johnson. One driver who needs no introduction in this lineup has to be our ex-Formula 500 world champion, Wayne Gunner. Terrific time. The car is strong and so is the team. Yes, a uh, big improvement from last year. And uh, no, the car's very strong and obviously we're hoping for a good result this weekend. Have a good one. Thank you, Mike. Wayne Garner, we wish him well. He's been a little unlucky this year, but one guy who's going to create a lot of headlines here, and that is young Craig Lowndes. You, Pup, you ready to go? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the car's feeling good. Uh, we're feeling good. The team's 100% uh, behind us, so, yeah, we're looking for a good result. What about that bloke in the 05 car, the old guy? No, he's given us a lot of support, and uh, hopefully we can beat him on the circle like anybody else. <laughs> Have a good one, Craig Lowndes. Well, a fellow who has won here twice, he did it in the Nissan. He's our ex-Australian uh, champion of uh, two years back. That's Mark Scaife. Are you primed for this one? We'll certainly give it our best shot, Mike, I think. No, that's not answering the question. No, we're primed for this one. It'll be no problem. We've we'll uh, just got to make sure the tyre works in this time. So uh, see, how, see how we go. Have a good one. Mark Scaife. If one driver needs no introduction whatsoever at Mount Panorama, it's the guy they call Peter Perfect. Will he be perfect today? You answer the question. <laughs> Remains to be seen, Mike. Uh, give it our best shot, see what happens. Third quick, you must be happy. Yes, very happy. Car's running like a dream and are going to unleash me and who knows. Go and get unleashed. Thanks, mate. Good luck to Peter Brock. We've met one of the Johnsons. Now, the fella who is going to run the car, the 17 car, is Dick Johnson. 
We've spoken to your son. Are you ready for poll? <laughs> well, as long as he doesn't beat me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, mate. I will, thanks. And that leaves us with the challenge between the guys setting the pace here at Mount Panorama. And I refer to the baby-faced assassin, Glenn Seat. You'd love to get rid of that tag, wouldn't you? Absolutely, mate. <laughs> Can you do this two years in a row? Well, I'm going to do my best. I think we've got a real good chance. Um, we've got a, a great engine in to, for today, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. We've got a great package. Good one. Have a good one. And that leaves the man who's been the fastest here at Mount Panorama for the last two days. Loves it in the wet. We'll see what he thinks about the dry. Larrick and Larry Perkins. Can you do this? Well, I'm certainly going to try, that's for sure. Well, good luck to you. That's the top ten for Tui's 95. Back to you, Bruce. Gary, they'd be feeling a little tight in the tummy, wouldn't they? But uh, one man who'd be feeling pretty loose today, I think pretty happy with himself, is Glenn Mason. He's probably the luckiest guy in Australia. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was a phenomenal uh, crash yesterday in the Suzuki Cup event. There's the car rolling, barrel roll six times, jumped the fence, ended up in a gully 100 metres from the racing surface. He was conscious when they cut him out of the car. He's in hospital still. He's got a fractured cheekbone and a broken thumb. That's all. He was conscious when they cut him out of the car. He'll be leaving hospital today. He will be here at the circuit tomorrow. Can you believe getting out of that mess with just so slight injuries in, in relation to that uh, crash? Well, it's a remarkable story. There's been some fine tuning in the seat and camp. Let's go down to the pit lane now with Andy Raymond. Thank you very much, Bruce. And it's been a case of musical chairs for Team Peter Jackson. Glenn Seaton nominated Alan Grice as the co-driver, but uh, put David Parsons into the hot seat after some impressive practice laps. That's uh, quite a compliment from the boss. Yeah, it is indeed, Andy. Uh, I'm, honestly, I'm very, very happy to be with AJ or uh, uh, Glenn, but uh, whichever, as long as I've got a seat, four wheels and steering wheel, look, I'm wrapped. He did it last year in the two East top ten. Can he do it again? Well... Not being biased, but I'd love to see it. Love to see it happen. But uh, Perkins is going to be there, and Young Lounge, like you just don't know. It's it's going to be really good. With the temperature being a little cooler, is it hard to warm the tyres up so they're at optimum temperature for that one hot lap? Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, I'm pleased I'm standing here, and the boys can get into it. But uh, yeah, it is. It's very, very hard, and uh, and they're just going to have to watch their step a little bit and uh, and try and nail it at the same time. David Parsons there with uh, Andy Raymond. We have Tony Longhurst. He is the first guy to run this morning in two East top 10 for 95, the uh, Castrol Falcon. He's had uh, a season of learning, setting up his own uh, V8 team. I think he's acquitted himself very well, Alan Moffat. He certainly has, Mike, because it's not easy to put one of these cars together, and he did it very quickly over the Christmas break last year. Uh, obvious teething problems at the beginning of the Shell Series, but here he is at Bathurst in the top 10, and I think that's a compliment for anyone. I said five Commodores and five Falcons in the top 10 as we welcome Mark Osler to the broadcast today, and uh, who's your pick? Well, isn't it tight? I mean, I've trying to pick a winner out of this 10 is just so difficult. Gary Wilkinson referred to before, top eight covered by less than a second. The top 10 are covered by just 1.6 seconds on a 6.2 kilometre circuit. That is absolutely amazing. Fabulous is uh, working uh, those tyres down to uh, Caltech's chase. The left, then the right for uh, Tony Longhurst. Tony, the first of the Yokohama teams. Yes, there is really a good uh, tyre battle going on here, and a healthy one too. Yokohama, Bridgestone, and of course uh, Dunlop, probably the ace supplier at the moment, coming through to take the flag and commence his lap of the top ten. The runoff today, $15,000 to set quick time. Well, as Mike said earlier on, tremendous effort from Tony Longhurst in 1995. Built this car in just ten weeks at the beginning of the season. He had a few engine problems early on the season, picked up... A uh, very prominent engine builder in Sydney by the name of Wayne Jones, who, by his own admission, has given the car another 60 or 70 horsepower toward the end of the season. And boy, isn't he got some speed out of this thing. Well, this is one place where you need every horsepower you can find. You'd sell your grandmother for one of them if you, if you could find it on a Saturday night here. But Tony doing well. He uh, locked up a break there on the approach to Mountain Straight, but he's got it under control here. He's got to come in here nice and cleanly. Car bouncing a little bit there, but only because he's throwing it. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't necessarily race it like that, and bear in mind the tanks are almost empty, just enough to get around for a couple of laps. Well, Tony, like all the Ford runners, very concerned about the aerodynamic alterations to the Falcon in the lead-up to this race, but just a few weeks before he did admit, after a lot of testing at Lakeside, he had the car beautifully balanced. He was very confident at the speed he was going to get out of the car. You can hear the crowd cheer, puts the wheels up on the ripple strip, maximum speed as he comes over the top of the mountain. It's a brave move to use the, uh, that amount of real estate there, but he's holding it very firm, hasn't made any mistakes so far. 
close to the wall. You want to come in here tight around Dunlop uh, corner into Forest Elbow. Pretty good entrance and flows out to the outside. Now works uh, Conrod straight. Big uh, crowd here this morning for uh, the top 10 runoff at Tui's on top of the mountain. And Carr absolutely flat strap as it crests this hill and runs downhill now for the right hand shot to Caltex Chase. Just listen to the engine. Fabulous. You've only got to stand beside the fence there and feel that massive wave of air almost push you off your feet. Unbelievable speed through there. Picks up a wheel there. But so does everyone else just clipping the curb on the exit to that corner beneath the Bridgestone Bridge and down to complete his lap. You'll be able to see it in just a second. Tony Longhurst actually, I think, qualified uh, for the 10 last year at the back and made his way up through the pack. Tony Longhurst at 2.13.89. 2.13.89, the time for Tony Longhurst. That sets the benchmark for the morning. Yes, he actually pole vaulted about four or five cars last year, Tony, in, the, uh, in his final run with the Benson and Hedges Commodore. Well, 2.13.89, that's about uh, seven or eight tenths down on his time yesterday, but he was the first guy out in the track this morning. So maybe the times will get progressively quicker. Tony Longhurst into pit lane. And we should have the circuit. Alan, yeah. Alan Jones in the uh, first of the uh, Peter Jackson Falcons. He'll ring its neck. Make no mistake, got a fresh engine in last night. He's been pushing at every practice session and uh, has really got the car under control. He seems to be very happy with it. So just warming it up, uh, virtually going probably uh, nine tenths here uh, to get as much heat into the tires as possible. Bridgestone tires traditionally have always liked to, uh, been a little bit slow to get heat into the mark and they uh, they like uh, every lap of practice they can get. So he might throw it around even a bit more through the chase. Well, that is the interesting difference between the Peter Jackson cars and the Shell cars this weekend. The Peter Jackson car obviously running Bridgestone tires, the uh, Shell cars on Dunlops. And it was the Peter Jackson cars that set the pace for the Fords early in the in practice. First practice session Wednesday, Seaton was just uh, two tenths behind the fastest car at the time. So they really have been setting the pace, but the Shell team have closed the gap as the weeks progressed. The exit to the chase, and Jones comes down, he'll get the green as he works his way into pit straight. The guy that's used to uh, qualifying, standing on them. He used to always qualify well in, when he had his Williams. And uh, this is a business where you have to get up to the front of the, of the grid. Guy with enormous experience. 1980 World Formula One champion. Also Australian GT champion. He's driven everything from Can-Am cars to sports cars at Le Mans. He's driven just about everything and done it with great style. Great style and great verve. And tremendous speed. Heading up the Holden Hill. Jonesy working his way to Repco, the right-hander. Using every ounce of the road there, right over, oh, wheel over the white line. He's trying to drift through here. That rock doesn't actually go all the way down to that arm coast, so that shot doesn't look as dangerous as he's just made it look. Yes, just locks it up a little bit on the way in. It is, it is fabulous to watch these guys, Alan, on these one-lap qualifiers. They can really hang it out. The fastest times are found, just those millimetres from the wall. Look out for our cameraman there. <laughs> and they know they don't have the disappointment of going over the brow of some of these blind corners Look at and that. seeing somebody Sticks. right on the line again there. Sticks the wheel right over the white line, 200 kilometres an hour across the top of the mountain. It's an unbelievable roller coaster ride as they come over here across Skyline. Alan Jones, look at the split compared to Tony Longhurst. Well, it was a 110. It was pretty quick. Actually, he is uh, marginally faster than uh, Longhurst at the top of the mountain. Longhurst did a, about a 128 that part of the track last time around. Alan Jones it's putting a, very, a nice quick one here. Yeah, it's a very smooth run. He hasn't put a foot wrong here. He's not locking up anything. It's uh, squeezing through every one of those corners. Well, Jones, four tenths of a second faster at the same point across the mountain that time. So he's on a quicker lap than Longhurst. If he can carry that speed all the way down Conrod, I'm sure he'll be faster. Here he comes on his way. Listen to it. No backing off. Break time into Caltech's chase. Through the gears. Look at the way he just slides he into did. the chase he, there. He was hanging on to it. She was a little taily there. He's got it set up loose. Absolutely maximum performance from the Peter Jackson Falcon. Jones hammering this engine back through the gears. 2.06 as he swings back toward pitch straight. Yeah, it's going to be a lot quicker, isn't it? 
across the line now to take the flag. He's in the 12s, yeah. a 212 7 1. A 212 7 1 to Alan Jones. So he goes to the top of the order, but there's a lot more fast guys to come. The two is top 10 from Bathurston. We'll be back in just a moment. Tui's 1000 Top 10 Day at Mount Panorama, Bathurst. Fabulous crowd in here. The weather is beautiful. It's a little cool, but the sunny. And out on the racetrack at the moment, driving car number 18 is 21-year-old Stephen Johnson from Daisy Hill in Brisbane. The son of Dick in the Shell FAI Falcon. What a fabulous day for Dick and for brother Johnson's for dad and the son. Such the a personal personable son as well a gentleman well-mannered and uh, emulating his dad before he's even uh, had a year in a car just a fabulous and what confidence too for dad to say all right you've earned your spurs son charlie o'brien uh, will sit out the uh, top 10 qualifying so two johnsons will line up and here's the green flag coming out of stephen johnson brings the falcon across the line beneath the two east bridge and works his one lap here at mount panorama First of the second generation races in uh, Australian touring car racing. And boy, this guy's cool head and his composure and unbelievable raw speed. An indication of the future of touring car racing in this country. We're in pretty good shape. This guy really has impressed a lot of people in a very short period of time. He reminds me of the chance that Glenn Seaton got when he was taken by Fred Gibson yep. into the uh, Nissan team, Datsun team at the time, and able to be nurtured by Fred and his dad, Bo. Uh, given good good equipment, but the talent was there and Stephen has got the same opportunity and he's certainly using it well He doesn't just uh, cash in on his dad's famous name either. This guy is so committed to motorsport He lives it eats it breathes it 24 hours a day he studies racing videos He just studies lap times. He studies everything about motorsport almost as an art form and he's so heavily into it so committed to it uh, It really is very impressive really wound up there you can see the leverage in the chassis when you see that wind up in the body that's not happening by uh, wind power that's horsepower look at that look at whipping that. it through oh. that corner any fellow that takes that curve up there has got the brave pills on board we'll check the splits for you at forest elbow in comparison to two other cars gets the wheel up in the air he's driving this car very very hard but so tidy so far hasn't put a foot wrong down through the elbow, back through the gears, lining up for Forest Elbow and Conrad straight, a critical corner this. Through there nice nicely. Quick no exit. Trouble. He'll whip that up now through. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth speed in the Hollinger six speed boxes. Everybody running this fabulous Hollinger gearbox uh, designed by Peter Hollinger in Melbourne. A world-class uh, contribution to motor racing. Check the splits for you, Forest Elbow, but seven hundredths of a second slower than Jones when he reached out the elbow that time around. But he may have picked up a little bit of speed on the straight. These shell forwards are generating enormous horsepower Terrific. at, at uh, Bathurst this weekend. He makes the exit from Caltex Chase beneath the Bridgestone Bridge. Come down and complete his one lap here at Mount Panorama. Previous best of 2.12.7.1 to Alan Jones. Junior Johnson out of the final turn comes across the line. Fairly close, maybe in the 13s, yes, at 2.13.1.1, the time for Stephen Johnson. 2.13.1.1, not a bad effort at all. And he has a very uh, uh, experienced co-driver tomorrow in Charlie O'Brien from Queensland. So an all-Queensland effort here with the exception of John Bauer, um, the Tasmanian who will share with uh, Dick Johnson. Dick going to run the car this morning as uh, Stephen Johnson heads back down uh, pit lane. And they'd be well satisfied with the performance of uh, Junior here this morning at Mount Panorama. He's got a lot of supporters, a lot of drivers, a lot of time for him. Let's go to Andy Raymond. Thanks a lot, Mike. And you can bet the uh, the butterflies were building up in Stephen Johnson at 2.13.1.1. Uh, just trying to keep it straight for the race. I really wasn't interested in going for a time because it really doesn't matter where you start. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the race because I think we've got a good chance and I didn't want to destroy the chances by uh, making a mistake in qualifying. Congratulations. Thank you, Andy. Well done. The second generations are working the pit lane too. Give, give, give an example of yes. Stephen Johnson's cool head. That's it. The guy is just approaches it with such a level head. It's very impressive. This guy needs very little introduction to uh, motor sporting followers. And I throw that under two and uh, four wheels. Wayne Gardner in the Coca-Cola number seven car. 35 years of age, looks a lot younger. From Wollongong in New South Wales, third of Bathurst here in the Tui's 1,093.
500cc motorcycle champ at 87, won 18500cc Grand Prix events and two Australian 500 Grand Prix events, both of those at Phillip Island, two great moments in sport. Wayne Gardner looking to go better than his second of two years ago, his own team sponsored by Coca-Cola, very supportive and here he comes out to take the green, they go beneath the Tui's bridge. Well, he has Gardner. a nice good uh, clean run onto the straight, they don't want to be locking it up from the first corner before they even get a run at the timing light. The beam is uh, under the track, uh, radio controlled, and uh, the car trips the beam automatically. There's no argument at all about somebody slipping on stopwatches here. We've got the world-class timing system installed here with the monitors on every car. Well, this guy gets the bravery award for me for the week. I was watching him through the traffic on the top of the mountain, just scintillating stuff. He's just so quick in the car. He hasn't been making any mistakes. The car has been very, very fast all week. I think what you're seeing there, Mark, is uh, with his motorbike background on so many different circuits that must have been hairy all over the world, that Bath is probably less intimidating to him than it is to a number of drivers. Over our track cam, up toward the top of the mountain, over Reed Park, it's a wheel in the air. Inside the white line cheer from the crowd, Gardner, right on the limit as he comes toward McPhillamy Park this time around. He pulled a perfect lap here at Mount Panorama last year with the exception of the dipper where he got it up on two wheels. We'll see whether he's cured that as he heads down. Very capable co-driver, Neil Crompton, for tomorrow's great race. Here we go, heading to the dipper. That was much better. Keep in mind, too, Gardner was the fastest man to Forest Elbow in last year's runoffs, but he really lost it through to a lack of horsepower down Conrad Strait. They've got new Rob Benson engines this year. There's no shortage of grunt from the Coca-Cola Chevys, so he shouldn't be lacking for straight line speed. Nice exit from Forest Elbow. Yes, he's done well there. And let's check the split. He's the fastest man to Forest Elbow. 1 minute 27.80, so he's carrying that speed all the way down Conrod. This should be the fastest lap if he can carry that all the way down the main straight. We'll have a listen to the Holden engine or the Chevy as it works the straight. 280k. That's 180 mile an hour on the old scale, folks. They don't sound any better than that at Indianapolis, I can assure you. That's a fabulous ring out of that 5-litre ship. He comes beneath Bridgestone again, heading down. The Dunlop shot car of Wayne Gardner, sponsored by Coca-Cola. They're getting stronger throughout this season. Final corner comes up. Check it. Flag at the ready. A little sideways out of there, but it should be a good time just the same as he gets across the line. Yes, sir. 2.12.5.4. 2.12.5.4. Holden fans, Holden fans have just gone berserk along pit straight. Yes, fastest time of the day. He's done very well. He was trying hard there. And First. Nice to see him get a good result there. Fastest time so far. First man at the 127s of the split. Heading across the top of the mountain on his warm-up lap now is Craig Lowndes, man who uh, almost drove into the history books here at uh, Mount Panorama last year. You re recall the fabulous dice between he and John Bow in the closing stages of the Tui's 1000. He hasn't done a lot of touring car racing during the year. The Sandown 500 just went out and made quick time and then had a rush of blood, which he admits... He should have known better, but then went up to pass everyone in the race and finished in the sand trap. I think he's learned the lesson. He's, he's got that out of his system yep. now, and I'm sure that he's under well bridled here this weekend and uh, knows the responsibilities of getting the car to the finish line. But here he is on his... As a very uh, adequate co-driver tomorrow, too, um, is Greg Murphy, the uh, tiny turret uh, racer from New Zealand who... Uh, Everyone has a huge wrap on, terrific wrap on. So we'll see what Craig can do this time. He'll activate the timer as he goes beneath the two his bridge and he is underway. Craig Lowndes, the wheel of the Holden Racing Team Chevy. And uh, boy, that raw speed he showed at Sandown. And certainly, as Mike said, the speed at Bathurst last year. This guy has an enormous amount of natural talent. And if they can capture that, harness it, and turn it into that race craft, he is going to be quite a formidable opponent. If he doesn't learn anything working alongside Peter Brock, it'd be a, a, a silly boy, and uh, I don't think that's the case. He's got his nose down. Oh, gets a little bit sideways coming up. Uh, Repco Bend up toward the cutting that time around. Do they come to BP in there, right? Very powerful engines in these cars, and so they should be. They've been working on them for years and years, and uh, with the factory uh, knowledge and ability to get into the parts bin, uh, they really do sound, they're probably the nicest sounding cars on the track. And pull these things down 
Conrad with maximum speed. But he's handling a nice mark there. Sure is. A little, little kiss of that curve. Let's see how we go through here. A little squirt, a little bit of acceleration here now. Straighten it up. Natural to drop it there in the dipper. But looking very good. And looking fast. Sure is a little lock up there. Minor one, not didn't upset him. A little bit of understeer on the front of the car as it came out of Forest Elbow, but managed to gather it in. Look at the split. One minute, 26.89. Yep. The fastest man so far by a long way. Over a, uh, over a second, I think, faster than Wayne Gardner at the same point of the track. So he is flying. Yes, listen to it there coming through with our track mic picking that up. Watch him through here. Very yeah. smooth through Caltex. Now the exit. Down to the left-hander. Here he comes, Craig Lowndes. This will be fairly tight. Time's coming down all the time. The exit beneath the brick stops the clock. The time he had to beat was a 2.12.54. 2.11.55. Boy, is the heat up here at Mount Panorama. That's an excellent time. Here the crowd erupt. Craig Lowndes, fast time man. We'll take a break and back with more fast action from Mount Panorama. Or perhaps an ominous sign. Ain't no second prize. Welcome to Richard Hay, the tenth time at Bathurst. Almost a happy birthday for you, Richard. What does Craig Lowndes' time do for the, the five men still to come? Well, it puts huge pressure on them. It, it, it's faster than Larry Perkins managed to go in official qualifying. It puts enormous pressure on, uh, on Seaton. But the, it's wonderful, I think, to see a young guy like Craig Lowndes going so quickly. Uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic performance. He's two hundredths of a second faster than, than Perkins went before. Gardner, a good time from him, and Alan Jones. A great drive from Johnson, too. Very sensible and very mature drive from Junior Johnson. And Tony Longhurst, fifth quickest at the moment, and, and I suspect likely to stay there. Well, Richard, it's really set up now, isn't it? And you can set yourself up tomorrow during our telecast when you can become even more involved in the Tui's 1000. If you're hooked on the Tui's 1000, then we've got just the competition for you. It's the great race watch and win presented by Holden. All you have to do is call 0 55 and dial in the numbers of the cars you believe will finish first, second and third in the great race. Then dial in your own phone number and remember there is no limit on the number of calls or combinations during the day. If the computer selects your winning numbers, well here's your prize. A magnificent Holden SSVA Commodore valued at $42,300. There's nothing quite like it. With 165 kilowatts of power, limited slip diff, independent rear suspension, anti-lock brakes, and much, much more. The Commodore SSV8 is a stunning road machine. So enter Holden's Watch and Win competition. The number again, 0055-60677. And we'll announce the winner at the end of our Tui's Great Race telecast. Yes, a great competition tomorrow. Watch and win, thanks to Holden. And Holden looking sharp here with Craig Lowndes, the fast man, the leader of the pack for the 211.55. Can Mark Scaife go one better? And the Winfield Commodore, they've been fast here all week. They haven't been down in the low 11, so he's got a bit of work to do. But then again, Lowndes has broken new ground this morning. Mark Scaife underway in the number one machine. He's a fellow with a lot of experience around here and a very dedicated approach. He thinks about every, every lap he does, every lap he's got behind him. And uh, if there's any way that this car can do the job today the Fred Gibson team have thrown everything at it to make it the fastest possible for him it's been a great fight back and forth for this team you think of the terrible start they had to the year with Scaife's horrific crash in the wet at the Eastern Creek they have really lost their way for a while there he tumbled from one end of the grid to the other throughout the touring car championship but come the endurance races they really have got back to that dominant form they showed uh, in 1994 and they really are hungry for a win uh, ride up on the ripple there out of uh, Repco, but nothing to worry about as long as the car doesn't get upset and uh, unset, I should say. They're always upset with drivers like this behind them. This is a team that's been working very, very hard on their fuel consumption from the Chevy V8s. Fred Gibson absolutely committed to a four-stop strategy if he can do it tomorrow. 
and he considers that'll be critical in winning the race. We shall see. Boy, it's going to be tight at the, at the top. Well, we saw how many cars were on the same lap last year, and these fellows know that one pit stop save uh, upwards of 30 seconds at that stop and the downtime in the pit lane. Certainly a good strategy. Lock, lock up break. there. Yep. Gets a wheel up in the air through the dipper. That lock brake didn't seem to uh, unsettle the car too much. Just shaves the yeah. concrete wall as he comes down toward Forest Elbow. That's Tremendous the... commitment from Scope. Very close there. Nice, fast, tidy exit from the elbow. Check the split for you. He's slower than Lowndes out of there. A 127.66. So quite a few tents down on Lowndes. We've still got the finesse through the chicane. Well, he's quick down through here. Doesn't button it off. Goes over, right over, off the road. He's still accelerating the brakes. Lights come on. He travels a little further into the chase than most. Look at that. Just stuck the outside wheel yep. over the white line as he turned in. He's using every millimetre of tarmac he can get his tyres on. Puts it up on the ripple strip on the way out. Down into the left-hander. This will be it. Well, oh, locks it up on the inside, comes out. As straight as it came across the line, not much in it, but uh, 2.11.95. 2.11.95, they're all getting down into the 11s. So that would make him second fastest yes. at this stage, provide Craig Lowndes, Wayne Gardner third, Alan Jones fourth, Stephen Johnson in fifth, and Longhurst currently in sixth position. Uh, he'll be happy with that. That was an excellent run for Mark Scape. He'll drive tomorrow with uh, Jimmy Richards. Right now, on the racetrack, the second of the uh, the mobile machines kind of a 05 driver doesn't need too much introduction he is a guy that does have a few laps around here yep we want to multiply 25 times a thousand that'll be a starting point plus practice plus uh, mental training in how many laps he does it in his mind every night and he's certainly got uh, some work ahead of him uh, team manager Jeff Breck saying they'll probably go for five field stops which would mean I guess Brock would do three full driving stints yeah. so he's going to have his work cut out for him on Sunday. Peter Brock comes across takes the flag as he works pit straight the mobile Commodore and you'll be able to hear the recognition factor of Brock once he's on the track up around the top of the mount they just break into spontaneous applause for this man. They know him. Well he is a Bathurst legend isn't he nine times winner as we take Telstra Mobile on that race cam there is Peter Brock, a great view of the man at work. This is a nervy corner coming up here because it's your first big break on a lap like this. And that Just camera angle really does show, Alan, how off camber that track is. Now the car slides across here under power. Absolutely. Here he comes up with the next really tricky corner. This is... Whoa! He's gone. lost it! Oh, and he's hit the wall big time. Two big hits. One in the rear, one in the front. Brock has overcooked it coming There's into the dipper and he's tires. paid the ultimate price i think he just uh that's so unlike peter brock something has obviously gone wrong there but uh, inside the car you saw him it broke okay. away and just backed itself into the wall a little bit well he didn't have any room for error and he was uh, moving at a fair clip as we were discussing a difficult uh, well, corner at any time race cam showed you quite graphically 90 kilometers an hour losing it and just look at that on the 7 replay again. He's not, he's not offline. He's just coming in a little bit late. With the, yep, and there. Looks at like the rear's broken no, loose. He's felt, he's felt that he was running. He's seen that he hasn't had enough territory. He's tried to save it. And unfortunately, with perhaps not tires as hot as they'd like to be, didn't really slow the car around in the spin. And uh, the wall's been very unforgiving which of course they are if you hit them at any speed. Well, that's two times in 12 months. The Bathurst has bitten Brock big time. Let's look at the, on the race, race cam. Look at the wheel. He flicks it around full lock, but he's a passenger at this side. Crash, crash. Actually hit there harder than we thought initially. It bounced around in the car. Dear, oh dear. He mad at himself. Well, you can see it's still rolling and the damage not bad enough to stop the wheels turning, but he's just trying to turn it around inside that concrete tunnel there and get it back to the pits. Yes, he... Well, I don't think they're sending another car. You can almost go drop her uh, into neutral and head on back down. Goodness me. No, if they could advise him that he could go back. So, Peter Brock, car number 05, makes it as far as BP cutting in the mobile machine. More action to come at Mount Panorama as the two E's top 10 continues.
Well, a little work to be done on the 05 car at the cutting, heading up to the top of the mountain. And the uh, Holden Racing Team boys, including Bev Brock, standing there thinking, that's just so unusual for, uh, for Peter Perfect. And I guess, Alan Moffat, you've been around here a few years and you've been around with Peter's team. Um, would you put that down to the fact that uh, cold tyres, the car's just broken away? Well, everybody has cold tyres when they go out. I, I think he did go in enormously quickly. Uh, with the, he looked under control, but at the last minute, I think when he saw the BP wall, he realised that he was running out of real estate. He tried to correct it as fast as he did, but it came around on him, and when it came around on him, and there was no room to go. I think he actually saved it as well as he could, considering uh, it could have gone in frontwards. Well, the uh, tilt tray truck is there they've had a hold up here because you have to pull the uh, the uh, front spoiler off these cars and Brock had to do it uh, all by himself with the, the help of a screwdriver up there to get it off and I'll take the car back to the pits it will probably make it back here here's the replay yes heading to the right brakes on he's in trouble about there I, yeah yes he started to well I'd, I'd say he's in trouble there he's definitely yeah. in trouble there and it's gone in and caught the back of the wall that's probably not the best angle, but you saw just how tight it was. And our, um, at our race cam replay, we'll show you just how heavy the hit was as Brock goes in. He tries hard there and realizes that now he's got to hope that he doesn't hit the wall. A couple of clouds on the rear they got. I don't think it's superficial, it won't damage. I don't think he hurt uh, structurally. They'll be, of course, uh, very nervous about this time. It's uh, only one more session at two o'clock this afternoon that they can practice the car before the big race. So naturally, time will be of the essence to get that back to the pits and uh, have the mechanics give it a short back and sides. What does that do to the confidence of a driver? Not that Peter Brock would be lacking any confidence, but and the team itself. He'll be more annoyed with himself yeah. than anything. I don't think he'll be, he'll be worried about his confidence. And there's every chance that some mechanical failure, if a, if a shock failed, it could have uh, thrown him in, 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 their, uh, in the manner that it did. Yeah. Well, I guess one guy who would uh, be feeling a bit of the pinch at the moment would be uh, Thomas Mazzera as Brocky uh, is ready to head on back down to the pits. Let's go down to uh, Andy Raymond's on pit lane. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, not a very happy Thomas Mazzera. Oh, well, you know, it happens when you're going quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was looking so good, Craig Lowndes, at a, a cracker pace. Yeah, he did a very good lap, and uh, I think it put the pressure on everybody else. And... Uh, you know, un unfortunately, you know, it was a little mistake there, and uh, but I, I don't think the car be too bad. The first thing we have to do put the race engines in and the race gearboxes and get the car out in the afternoon and uh, repair the, the panel damage uh, overnight. Has Peter spoken to anyone from the team? Uh, does he know how badly it's damaged? Uh, no, I didn't talk to anyone. I don't know. I don't know. Then uh, hopefully it's not too bad. Then uh, it's a back end. Then. Uh, you know, we should, should bash it out. But the most important thing is to, to run in all the, all the race gear we've got and we have yeah. to put in now. Well, we certainly hope you can enjoy a bit of a drive this afternoon. Well, you know, that's the aim anyway. <laughs> Thomas Mazira there. There's the uh, Brocky 05 car. The, the uh, front air dam spoiler are off there on the uh, back and the car is just about to head back to the pits. We've still got uh, Dick Johnson, Glenn Seaton and Larry Perkins to come as the Tui's top 10 continues for 95 at Mount Panorama at Bathurst. A beautiful day at Bathurst. The Tui's top 10 continues with one of the all-time favourite campaigners on the racetrack at the moment. Car number 17 has been driven throughout 1995 by Dick Johnson, the 18 car by John Bauer. And for the Tui's 1000, they combine their talent, the resources, to share car number 17 and expect a quick one from Dick, who actually uh, ran into a problem last year at the same spot that Peter Brock did. Yes, well, they're all trying to pick up time on the slow corners. I mean, uh, obviously, everybody can come down the straights at about the same speed, so you've got to gain on your opposition through the corners. But here we have Bathurst winner. 81, 89, 94, second at Bathurst in 88 and 92, winner of the Sandown 500 in 94 and 95, a nice back to back, and winner of the ATCC, 81, 6, in 82, 84, 88, and 89. Incredible Dick, record. Yes, sure is. Dick Johnson, who was so wild with himself last year for clipping the uh, corner, clipping the wall at BP, he takes the green flag and he's underway. Johnny Bout gets. Uh, 
respite this morning. He can sit and watch, Dick. Certainly those times by Junior Johnson and Craig Lounge shows the pressure these young guns are putting on the Bathurst, Bathurst legends. Incredibly quick times early in the morning and it really is putting on the pressure on guys like Brocky and Johnson. We take Dunlop Tyre race cam aboard car 17. Johnson looking as cool as a cucumber as he normally does. 240 kilometres an hour, brakes hard, back through the gears and up toward Repco corner. The right hander through Repco, wide exit. Just out on the kerb. That's okay, as long as he's side coming. This well, was the corner that brought him undone and has already brought Peter Brock undone. He goes in there nicely. The exit is perfect. Yeah, not me, thank you. Yep. No, he knows where that wall is. Well, there's certainly been plenty of accusations of uh, political gamesmanship pointed at this car during the week when they came here. The fastest time Johnson did was some three seconds behind uh, Peter Brock. And over the last three days, they found three seconds in this car. So however they've done it, it's certainly percolating right now. And he's certainly driving that on the curb twice there. That is hairy stuff. Nicely through the dipper. You can't bounce it through here. Just over that little hole in the dip there. It looks like a very, very quick lap. Always is from Dick because he drives the circuit better than most. Absolute equal between John Bow and himself. Roof cam Beautiful. via Dunlop as they make the exit out of that. Now the uh, open spaces of Conrad Strait. And this is where you'll get the opportunity to see the speed and listen to that great V8. That is fantastic. Here we go. Up into fifth, sixth. So the windscreen wiper moving around in the airflow coming over the screen. 180 miles an hour on the old scale. And he flings it through Caltex Chase. Hard on the brakes. About 200 metres to slow from 275k to about 90 for this little corner here. Very tidy lap, Johnson. Not as quick on the splits coming out of the forest elbow. Beneath the Bridgestone Bridge. Now through the gears, a dab of the brakes, get it straight, out through here, check and flag time, a little sideways beneath the bridge, and Johnson goes across the line, 2.11.55 is the time to beat, but no, that's well from it, the 2.13.19, 2.13.19, the time for Dick Johnson in car number 17. And that puts him sixth at this stage. So okay, Johnson. so Johnson to 13. 1-9. 1, One minute 28.05 at the split, so he was considerably down on Scaife, Craig Lowndes and Wayne Gardner at that point on the track. Car number 30, Glenn Seaton, underway as he heads up uh, Mountain Straight. Guy that uh, was sitting just back behind the leaders the last couple of days, but yesterday delivered a beautiful time, only a couple of hundredths of a second behind Larry Perkins and gazumping John Bow at the same time. You don't do that very often. <laughs> well, this guy was... Whoa, look at him get really sideways coming up the hill there. A fantastic bit of car control. He kept his foot right into it. He did. That was a brave move. This is the cold tyres on these. Just one lap to go. That was a spectacular slide by Seaton. And boy, didn't he keep the thing balanced. Look, he's getting sideways again. He's right out of shape. That's two. In the space of a few hundred metres, he's really untidy across the top of the mountain here. Just showing the enormous pressure these lead guys are under to cap these times by the young gun set earlier. Seat all over the road. Gathered it up a bit here, brush of the brakes, rear wheel gets in the air, flying across skyline, down the hill once again. Tremendous driving from Seaton. He's moving here, Mark. He's right on a razor's edge. Gets the wheel a good foot in the air as he comes through the dipper. Arrows the car down toward Forest Elbow. Well, those two lurid slides are going to cost him time. We'll check the splits when they come out of the elbow, but Seaton will be kicking himself, I'm sure. Well, fortunately, he had a little real estate where he could slide it, unlike Peter Brock, who the same thing happened, but a wall waiting for him. But yeah. Glenn did hold on to that very well and very bravely, I thought. One minute, 28 seconds dead. He's just a little bit faster than Johnson to that point in the track, so he's in the 28s on the split, and uh, they will have cost him a bit of time. Most of the cars have proved to be pretty equal in the run from Forest Elbow round to complete the lap. So the real time is being made up on that first two-thirds of the lap. The exit to Caltex Chase. Seaton trying to be super smooth after getting a little sideways at Repco. Beautifully turned out car. Always is. PJ team brings it beneath the bridge and across the line. Lap completed. Full of incident there for Glenn Seaton. Yes, I think his heart would be in his mouth still. Well, hasn't come up on the screen yet, but a 2.12.54 tw 
2.12.54, which is identical time to that uh, set by um, Wayne Gardner. So nothing between he and Wayne Gardner. That little uh, sideways motion at Repco uh, cost him dearly, and that because uh, he's been uh, down into the 11s. At this stage, only Lowndes and Scape, the only guys into the 11s this morning. Could this man do it? All the pressure comes back on uh, Larry Perkins, who would love to have pole for this one. And he knows a youngster out there by the name of Craig Lowndes wants to steal his thunder here at uh, Mount Panorama today. Does he ever? Well, Lowndes stole pole position from a lot of them at uh, Sandown a few weeks ago. And even though he blotted his co copy book a few laps later in the race, he's just shown the tremendous speed he can get out of these Group A touring cars. Listen to the crowd. This man is Mr. Popularity at Bathurst. Won this race in sensational fashion in 1993. Third last year. And boy, hasn't he topped the timesheets all week. The Castro Commodore absolutely flying at Mount Panorama this weekend. And let's not forget the many times that he called drove with Peter to get the, the wins uh, in the uh, Brock camp. Back through the gears, up through Repco. Minimal amount of wheel movement. Larry's just so tidy on these. Maximum pressure. One lap qualifiers. Let's just watch him here. Into, oh, well, the camera's gone off, but uh, thought we might have seen him in the same style. Not very taking any chances, actually. Very tidy so far. Every lap's about the same with Larry, though, isn't it? It's just he very seldom spins it. Guy was enormous experience. He had it flying there. Yep. So the way the car was leaning towards that wall. Listen to the crowd. Absolutely pandemonium across the top. Larry on a flyer, just brushes the brakes, hooks a rear wheel in the air through McPhillamy Park, down towards Skyline, very tidy so far. Hasn't put a foot wrong. Perkins under enormous pressure to beat this audacious youngster, Craig Lowndes, 2.11.55. Castrol Race Camp shows the Commodore slammed down on the tarmac there as he comes through the dipper, brushes the dirt wall on the inside, back through the gear, sets himself up for maximum exit speed from the elbow onto the straight for the final time. He's got every part of the course right. It just depends on how quick he is now. The, the, the lap actually has been super smooth. Works across to the left-hand side. Listen to the V8 work. Kind of takes your breath away, doesn't it? Certainly didn't back off then, did he? Well, he was seven-tenths of a second slower when he reached the elbow, seven tenths slower than Craig Lance. So Lowndes could well be the pole man of the two. He's 1,000 for 1995. And Let's see could, what Perkins can do here. And we could also have a front row of uh, Commodores too. Last corner comes up. Perkins sideways, guns it, straightens it up. I don't think he's done it. He brings it across the line in the 12s. No, 212, 48. 212, 48 to Larry Perkins. He might well have a slice of the front row, but the master at Mount Panorama is going to be Craig Lowndes done it again and they have uh, he's come up with pole position for the two classics the two endurance races Sandown and now today for two his top ten at Mount Panorama Larry just fires it's hard to get back in that pit lane there yeah, straighten a, the cars up a U-turn it's a bit uh, well, the crowd's giving him the raspberry he stalled it a couple of times there he is underway so Craig Lowndes wasn't he set the place on fire this week he heads on back. Uh, I think Larry will be satisfied. I don't know, but over the moon about it. He's been the man that's set the pace since Thursday, but Larry, a 2.12.48. That'll put you on row number two for the big one. I could be worse, couldn't it? <laughs> but no, that's all I could do on the day. And uh, uh, congratulations to young uh, Craig if he did the best. Uh, just got to get it right now for tomorrow. Tell me, one of the guys said earlier, these young blokes get out there and have an, and don't have uh, any fear. They haven't hit any walls yet. You guys, the, the wiser heads. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, I gave it all I could do then, and the other guy went quicker. Larry Perkins would like to have been able to uh, sneak pole, but I tell you what, Lance has been the uh, scene stealer here today at Mount Panorama. No doubt about it, Al. Yeah, yes, he has, and I think uh, whatever uh, misdemeanors he had at Sandown, they're well and truly behind him. To get pole around here, you don't do that by accident. You do it with a great team behind you, and you do it with a lot, a lot of heart. Basically, we have two races, don't we, at Mount Panorama. We have the race that takes four days to resolve this, yes. the top ten, and then everyone has three hours to get their cars back in, in uh, trim to run an endurance race tomorrow. Two o'clock, we've got to be ready for uh, an hour's practice. Yep. Let's have a look at the uh, top ten times. Craig Lowndes, pole at Mount Panorama for the Tui's 1000, and a 2.11.55.
Second quick, he's done it. Mark Scaife, the Winfield Commodore, a 2.11.95. Then it's Perkins in the Castrol Commodore, a 2.12.48. Wayne Gardner, not a bad effort. The outside of row number two, the Coke Commodore, a 2.12.54. Then it's Glenn Seaton, car number 30, the Peter Jackson car with a 2.12.54. Then, uh, of course, Jones and Grice, they'll share the number 35 car. Alan Jones, a 2.12.71. Dick Johnson, I'm sorry, uh, that should be Junior Johnson, 2.13.11, seventh fastest. <laughs> And guess who is eighth quick? Are you happy about that? That's one? the old man. <laughs> two thirteen one nine. Tony Longhurst at two thirteen eight nine. And because he didn't actually complete a lap, he will now go from what he, what he was yesterday, that was third fastest, to tenth in the queue tomorrow. 